Bolas. We have the recording going now. She's she's one of our, our favorite guests here at the REC. We just love her. Well, all of the wisdom that she shares and, and the mentorship that she offers to our students. And, and, uh, and, and really, I'm excited a lot about this workshop today because uh, when we were talking about it, when we were setting it up, we were talking about how important it is to, to meet people where they are and to provide people with uh, with tools that they will actually use. And, and Rose is going to um, be sharing with all of us today how we can take advantage of some of the platforms out there, the legal platforms that a lot of entrepreneurs use to, um, to save money, but sometimes don't do don't do it right. And so we want to make sure that, that we get the, the scoop, the inside scoop from an attorney and Rose, I think, is one of the only attorneys who would actually take the time and do this with us. I, I think a lot of attorneys try to steer people away from these. So um, we really are grateful, Rose. Welcome. Thank you, Tanya. Hello, everybody. Let me know when I can get started and I'll share my screen. So if you want to go ahead and pull up your slides now um, while you're doing while you're doing that, um, okay. I'll just remind everybody to uh, when Rose is speaking, we, we uh, turn make sure that your microphones are turned off unless, of course, you have a question. You can also put that question in the chat and we will uh, respond to them periodically uh, through through the workshop. And then at the end, we'll leave some time for, for questions and answers um, with Rose. Um, I want to encourage all of you to uh, follow us on social media and uh, remember that you can access these videos of the workshops again on um on our YouTube channel. So it's just the Rec Innovation Lab on YouTube. And within about 24 hours is the usual turnaround, you'll be able to access these. So with that, I'll hand it over to, to Rose and uh, just also remind everyone, keep an eye on that on that chat. We'll be sharing with you a couple of resources that you can access and, some, uh, and a, a poll that you can give us some feedback. Uh, and Rose, welcome to the Rec. Thank you again, Tanya. Um, just to let you know, I'm on presentation mode here on Canva, so I can't really see the chat function. I'll, I'll um, keep an eye on it for you. And thank you. Know. you. Perfect. Thank you. And also, I am one for not lecturing much. I love um, interactive conversations. Um, so do feel free to interrupt me uh, if you have a mini question. Obviously, you have to get through the presentation today. Um, and then I'll have Q&A at the end so we can kind of go through in depth a little bit more. Um, as Tanya mentioned, um, this is not just a, a regular presentation and interaction, but I'll be going over a questionnaire also. So, and you'll get a copy of this either through the presentation or separately. Um, it's uh, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is really, uh, you know, my two cents, my reaction, my observations of legal tech industry, what they offer founders and new startups. Um, and so as always, it's not legal advice. <laughs> um, and take it to heart that, um, you know, others will have different opinions. So this mm -hmm. one's only my opinion today. So absolutely. Yep. I have to put um, that flavor in there, right? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So Self-service legal tech, hire an attorney or both. Um, so really the point of this uh, presentation today is that you are a startup, low budget, no budget for a lawyer. And you're just wondering what's out there that you could do yourself that uh, you wouldn't have to hire a lawyer for necessarily. Um, and you'll be quite surprised uh, what the offerings are out there. Um, I would just like to emphasize that this talk is a very high level for beginners, mostly. Um, and of course, um, everything is complicated in life. So <laughs> this is um, oversimplified. And I encourage you to either have a follow-up conversation with me or another attorney about any of the topics we talk about today. So let's just start with me. Um, I'm Rose Bolas. Um, I've been practicing law for about 21 years, just about. I uh, used to work in-house for corporations, uh, mostly financial institutions like Wells Fargo, Wachovia, PNC Bank. Um, I moved to San Diego from North Carolina about 13 years ago to work for Semper Energy. So I've been here quite a bit. And um, I started my own law firm a little over two and a half years ago. And I focus on three areas of the law, commodities, securities, and financial services. Uh, I think I might have misspelled something there. So, 
Um, but uh, anyway, what that means for you are, as new companies is that um, I bring big company experience to the smaller scale. So I've seen a lot and I um, understand uh, all of what the future is in terms of growth and um, you know, scalability for companies from a legal perspective. All right. All right, here's what we're gonna cover today. Okay, um, a real brief outline, the state of the legal, you know, state of legal tech as it relates to the topics that we talk about today, types of self-service legal tech, types of lawyers on and off tech platforms, how to choose the right self-service legal tech, and then sample self-service legal tech questionnaire. So really, again, a very high level, but very insightful because there, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, you're gonna to be like, what, are you serious? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, legal services is becoming more and more automated. Uh, but the question becomes, is it services or is it templates and automation and formalities? And I'd like to emphasize that all of it at this point today is templates and automation and formalities. So when we talk about services, we talk about that. We don't talk about advice or direction as to what you should do or should not do. Okay, so how big is the legal tech industry for startups? Well, I'm gonna actually answer this really focused um, in terms of what I've seen and what I've researched. 75% of founders today use some sort of legal tech. <laughs> so, so um, and I, I, I could tell you that through any touch point of where you are in, you know, as it relates to legal, where you are in your company, there's going to be a time where you're going to be looking for resources out there, whether it's, you know, formation and corporation, which probably is 100%, if not, you know, close to that for formation and corporation services, to issuing um, stock, to um, working with investors online, um, things coming, you know, um, online platforms coming to mind like AngelList or um, other types of um, online investor platforms. So, uh, and this is all lumped in into one per percentage by product service or subscriptions. And again, based on my experience, this is a very alarming percentage for me as a lawyer, because a, start a startup lawyer at that, because it's being trans the startup space as it relates to the formalities of forming and doing your early stage paperwork is going to be, I think, automated, automat automated 100% in the next two to three to five years so that you won't even have to talk to a startup lawyer and um, they're likely gonna be chat bots and all these other things. So here's where I think we are today. Um, it's a very big number. So how is self-service legal tech even allowed, right? It's not the practice of law. Um, forms and templates only, use at your own risk. Uh, all legal tech platforms, as far as I'm concerned that I'm aware of, have disclaimers that say, you should really speak to a lawyer because this is not legal services, <laughs> which is very interesting because you're essentially getting the outcome of legal services by using their forms, using their platform, and using maybe the lawyers that are on their platform, which we'll talk in a little bit. But just be aware that if something goes wrong, there really isn't anybody's fault but your own. If you use a platform, any platform at that, not just legal tech, you're likely using it at your own risk if you don't really do the due diligence behind understanding how the platform works and, and what sort of quote, remedies there might be to you um, if something, if the platform does do something wrong. Highly unlikely, but terms and conditions are certainly important, um, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> All right, types of legal service, uh, sorry, types of self-service legal tech. How are startups using legal tech? Okay, so I guess I, I categorize this in like the four main categories that startups are using legal tech. Obviously formation is what you've most probably most familiar with, right? So um, LegalZoom, incorporation and organizations, bylaws and operating agreements, buy-sell agreements, IP, IP assignments, 
anything and everything having to do with the first steps of creating your companies. Um, but aside from that, or in, in addition to that, depending on which platform you're using, and we'll go over those later, um, board and shareholder actions. So once upon a time, you needed a lawyer to uh, take minutes or make, you know, create minutes into board resolutions and have the board sign or vote. Likewise with shareholders, that stuff, it can be automated through certain platforms. Um, and, you know, you basically either let them listen in on your meeting or you send them notes and they make it all nice and pretty buttoned up for your corporate records. So certainly that's uh, something that's being more and more utilized by um, boards. The only thing there is, do you trust these platforms to maintain confidentiality of your ongoing business affairs? Uh, three, cap table and stock issuances. Um, those also once upon a time were um, really exclusive to securities lawyers like myself who would understand uh, all of the regulations, uh, securities regulations and exemptions and having uh, you know, the knowledge to uh, figure out how you were gonna be issuing stock. Um, that is no longer the case. Um, in most plain vanilla circumstances where you have accredited investors or you have employees or consultants or you have cap table company, you know, cap table management companies. And it's not just Carta, there's many up, coming up the pipeline, especially blockchain related, um, who are gonna be doing these things for founders and their companies. Uh, all the way to creating employee stock, uh, employee um, incentive plans um, and um, awarding in you know, creating awards under those plans. And then finally, pre-seed fundraising. Um, so you're, you've established your company, you're two years out, you're ready to raise money. Again, lots of platforms out there that can help you with that, um, automate it. Um, I'm aware of uh, a few that really have um, mastered the, the um, safe process, uh, simple agreement for future equity, and we'll get, get into that in a minute. Um, but uh, all the way to collecting the money for you and sending you the check. So you don't even have to open up a bank account, they'll do it for you. And you will, all your company is gonna get is the check and that's all you need to worry about. Of course, there are fees, costs, subscription prices, things like that that are associated with these services or these templates and forms processes. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's, it's all there if you look for it. Let's stop there to see if anybody- I was just going to ask Rose if you if you uh, could answer a question, and yeah. that that is about the uh, physical address then of of the business. So I know a lot of a lot of uh, students have issues with having a physical location for their business as they're moving around and they don't um, have a spot. Could they then, uh, with one of these legal services, not have a physical location to receive um, communication from? That's a great question. I'm actually going to. I'm going to answer it with Delaware in mind, okay. because most most right. corporations are formed in Delaware. Um, you have you can move around as much as you want, but in Delaware, you need to name a registered agent in Delaware in order to be a Delaware corporation. So that needs to be presence in Delaware uh, that won't be moving around. Uh, with respect to mailing address, certainly there is the ability to have a PO box, but for the tax side of Delaware franchise tax they do require an individual and address. Um, so that's why they, on the formation, they ask for an individual, um, not an agent, not a lawyer, like, and a social security number. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so, on, so to answer your question, you really do need a place to call home and have that on file with Delaware and then maybe even California if you do a foreign registration, but um, Yes, they need to be able to find you and you need to update them when you have, you know, when you have any kind of movement mm -hmm. around that. So no um, getting around that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think the underlying reason is the tax, like if the company doesn't pay or something like there needs to be a, you know, a person there to kind of backstop that, a founder, a shareholder. Um, but in any event, yeah. Yeah. So I uh, I don't that's I don't have any other questions for now in the chat. If anybody else has any, uh, feel free to to shout it out. If not, I think we can. Well, we're going to get into these in more depth, actually. Okay. So. Okay. 
Okay, so so the first one was formation self-service. Okay, bylaws, operating agreements, shareholder agreements, buy-sell agreements. Uh, nobody ever thinks of these agreements really when they incorporate. They think, oh, I'm incorporated in Delaware. Yay, you know, and now I have to put bylaws in place or governing documents and I need to figure out like who the who, you know, who who are the who are the the players in my company. Um, but for purposes of this slide, I just wanted to show that you can have legal tech actually prepare these documents for you. It's just a matter of what package or what a la carte product or whatever it is that you need. And it, it they'll, they'll spit something right out for you. Um, again, usually basic, right? So for bylaws, um, typically what I see is regular, um, you know, voting, uh, anything having to do like that's the base for Delaware law or California corporations code, just very basic. There isn't anything in there that's, um, you know, throwing in a wrench, for example, um, a lot of the times preferred shares are not addressed in some of the um, bylaws or as it relates to operating agreement, um, a profit interest unit or things like that where there's different types of structures where you take on investors later down the road a lot of the basic bylaws operating agreements don't address the, the, those types of structures. Some may, but a lot of them don't. So something to think about. Um, shareholder agreements, buy-sell agreements, things that happen or need to happen or um, understandings between the founders, the shareholders. Um, a lot of the times these agreements get forgotten, but are very important to sustaining the company in the event that there is a loss of a founder, meaning, their death or, or, you know, there's a divorce and the, you know, a spouse wants to uh, take over the company or something, you know, these documents tend to speak to those types of issues. Um, and young founders for, or, or first time founders typically don't pay attention to them, but there are platforms that address these, which is amazing, actually, again, at a very basic level, but at least it's on your radar once you create one of these and it's on your radar to update it if you bring on um, more co-founders or um, experienced officers um, you know it's good to at least have them and then update them they're always you're always able to update these documents uh, board and shareholder actions uh, consents voting minutes approval again um, you know it's like having your own in-house counsel <laughs> well, it's obviously um, more work for you, but it would always be good to maybe delegate to somebody in your company who likes compliance or likes legal, who may want to work with some of these legal tech companies to uh, keep track of the, mi the minutes, you know, um, the ongoings of the um, affairs of the company as it relates to founders, officers, advisors, and directors. Um, and I just did a, a quick description of each of the um, each of the, the players, if you will. One thing I want to say about advisors is, um, you know, usually with advisors, the biggest question I get is, well, you know, how should I treat them in terms of awards or equity? Are they, you know, should I, you know, what should I do with them? Are they, are they really part of the team? They're not, they're actually consultants. Um, they're not directors or officers or shareholders, they're consultants. Just like if you were to hire a dev, dev team, um, they are outside third parties. So be very careful about how much information you really do or need to share with an advisor. Um, they usually don't have information rights like shareholders do. And a lot of times companies forget that. Um, why is that important? Because um, as a fiduciary for your company, whether you're an officer or director, you know, there's certain things that are really just company specific that need to maintain, you know, com company confidentiality. And if you have your advisors in these discussions or whatnot, you know, a lot of the time, you know, the privilege or whatever it is that you're trying to protect within your company, even proprietary information um, could be compromised. Advisors do have confidentiality requirements, but, um, you know, I often just see them lumped in with everybody else and they're not held to the same standard. I don't know if anybody has a question about that, but. Rose, do you have like, so when you have these people that you're sharing information with, are there like specific forms that you have them fill out? Like if, if I was a CEO, like would I like make sure that everyone has like these certain forms filled out? Like so, an NDA. 
Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say it was a form. So advisors enter into advisory board agreements or consulting agreements and they get, you know, they um, just like any third party you're hiring for your company do something as an independent contractor, if you will. Um, they have provision, you, you put provisions in those agreements to protect you from, from anything from breach of confidentiality to any IP that they may be create as a result of their services to you, uh, that it, you know, it's assigned to the company, things like that, especially also when you provide them awards, stock awards, things like that, then they are subject to the equity plan, in which case they would be, you know, um, uh, it, there are provisions in the plan to protect the company such that if an advisor is let go or they don't do something, company can buy back their shares, things like that. So same with officers, directors, employees, founders, stockholders, but advisors are not in the company. They're outside of the company. Do you have time for one more question? Rose? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I actually uh, uh, had a question on uh, when, when someone won't sign an NDA, I know this happens a lot with angel investors, VCs, even, even advisors and attorneys don't want to sign uh, an, NBA, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, do, how, how would you recommend that um, entrepreneurs proceed in that situation? So if it's, if it's intellectual property that has rules around it that clearly state if you were not to maintain you know, the confidentiality around it, that it's going to ruin your application or it's going to interfere with your value evaluation because you're not able to get something. I would stand firm on that. Um, as it relates to proprietary information, trade secrets, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of the times, if you're going to be talking to someone, you should build a relationship and, and know that they are credible in the industry, that they've dealt with similar issues and haven't gone off to to the world to do bad things that's how i would handle that so know who you're talking to and get a sense of whether or not they know what they're doing with your information right and then yep. you feel a lot better but there are times especially investors this day and age mm -hmm. they just won't sign anything and you know why that is yeah because of the liability because mm -hmm. if something goes wrong they're essentially you know, going to take a hit for right. having ruined your company because they're being accused of something. Nobody yeah. likes to take on liability. Right. Agree. I, I, I love that you said this. And, and I always uh, I always feel that there's no contract in the world that can replace trust. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you said that. So, yeah. Yep. OK, and then uh, Legal tech does address cap tables and stock issuances, equity plans, stock awards, issuances, approvals, um, and cap tables. Um, so let's, I'm gonna, so obviously I've named all of these, but I wanna focus on the cap table. Uh, a lot of new founders um, don't realize that cap tables are actually the heart of your company. So, Think of it as a way of monitoring what's going on with your company. And anytime and every time you look at a cap table, you're going to be able to tell like where your company is in terms of its value, in terms of its owners, in terms of its players, in terms of you know who's getting awarded things. I mean, it's really like the, I think it's the backbone of a company. And all these other topics, equity plan, stock insurances, approvals, all of this can all be managed under like a cap table management company like Carta, for example. I'm not, I, I am a law firm um, partner with Carta because I'm always using their services for my clients. But um, what I'm saying, not just Carta, it could be any kind of tap, cap table management company. They, they make it very easy for you to keep your corporate records like as a data room they make it very easy for having all of your paperwork kind of interrelate with what's going on with the ownership of the company and so you know carta and others have really mastered the whole you know um cap table not just with respect to issuances and knowing ownership but also with getting uh founders to be organized which I, I find is like one of the hardest things for founders is you have all these documents and you don't know what to do with them. Well, if you sign up with a, you know, a cap table management company, it's kind of like it does it all for you. 
it says, oh, this was, you know, if you want to do this, it'll say, well, where's this consent? Where is this agreement? And then it'll make you upload it, right? Oh, I needed to do that and that as a result of this award or this ownership or this safe or, you know, so think of it, think of maybe organizing yourself that way via a cap table, even if it's just you in the beginning. Um, and you'll see that everything else will fall into place. And how do you spell that Carta? C-A-R-T-A. Carta, okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. And there was one more question. I don't know if you want to take yeah. it now, or it sure. was about a provisional patent. Uh, so uh, Mona asks if if it's uh, wise to get a provisional patent before discussing with investors and advisors um, for the first time. Yeah. So I think once you have a provisional patent, I think you're safe for a year until you have to actually go for the real one. So at that point, I think one would be even more comfortable having discussions. But I still think you need to keep them discreet as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, and know who you're talking to. One thing I wanna share here, and it's actually a horrible experience that happened to one of my founder friends. Um, she thought she was going to be acquired and was talking to a potential company that had an ownership interest in a competitor. And she thought that maybe they were um, interested in buying her company. It turns out they were fishing for information. And it, she didn't, it didn't occur to her till after that this entity that was looking for more information about her was really fishing in for information about the, the company that they partly owned. Yep. And, and very she, sad. And she ended up probably disclosing way more information than she should yeah. have. I've seen this happen so many times. Yeah. So it's something to be even, careful about. Yeah. Even when you're working with advisors, make sure you understand who those advisors also have as uh, companies they're mentoring or advising. Um, and then finally, accelerators like Techstars or, you know, um, uh, Founders Institute, all these companies, they're bringing in some really great, talented companies. But when you apply to these, like Y Combinator, when you apply to these, you have to disclose a lot. They really ask you to like in-depth questions about your technology and what you're doing. And then all of a sudden you don't get in. It's like, well, wait a minute, but then you see that there's another company just like yours that they've that they've decided to take, and all of a sudden, <laughs> wait a minute, you know. Um, so be careful about also that um, those online applicants. I'm trying to keep this all tech related, right? Online oh, yeah. related, but any online application or things like that that aren't promising anything, it, you know, promising confidentiality or you don't know where it's what whose hands it's going to end up in. You know, I'd be very careful. So a lot of people like use Google Docs or DocSend or things where, you know, um, uh, services where you put your documents in and then you'd have to, somebody would have to log in or provide their email so you know where your documents are, who you, who, who's viewing your documents. That might be a better way of applying through a link or just including a link to the area where they're asking for the information. Okay, I spent too much time on this slide. <laughs> Okay, pre-seed fundraising, self-service, safes, convertible notes, approvals, funds management, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, Carta issues safes now. There's a Carta safe in addition to being able to issue a uh, white combinator safe. Um, they don't help with the board consent, so you still need another service to help you with that or a lawyer um, to give the company authority to um, offer safes for investment. But, um, you know, there are companies that to have these these um, these documents ready to uh, email to your potential investor. Um, same thing as I talked earlier about approvals and then funds management. Having you know these companies have the ability to make it easy for you to receive a check. Um, everything from a direct investment to an SPV, you know, working with an SPV um, and then getting a check from the SPV. Um, so I, for purposes of this um, presentation, I didn't plan on naming too many names uh, simply because it's being recorded and I don't want to have any problems or trouble from any of these companies that, you know, may think that I'm bad mouthing them or, you know, or whatnot. So, but, uh, you know, just know that they're out there. And if you Google some of these keywords and online platform or, you know, legal documents for founders, you're going to be finding a slew of um, 
options that you can go with and investigate on your own as to you know who you may want to use. Um, and I'd be happy to um, talk to you further about what you consider using. And then also one of my plugs as being a lawyer in the startup space is I'm not afraid of legal tech at all. In fact, I'm an investor in legal tech and I have an angels group around legal tech. So I think it's the way of the future. I think it's fine. Um, but, um, but I also do consulting around it. Uh, so, you know, I'm not afraid to help founders be on legal tech and use it to, to make, make it so that the early stage of your company is not so legal expensive. Um, but I do, I do wanna emphasize that there are complexities around these issues or these topics that I'm bringing up that do come up where you do need a lawyer um, simply because they know the codes or they know the regulations. Um, and the, maybe the platform didn't, wasn't built to address the one-off situations, um, bringing on a co-founder or buying back shares or redeeming a note, things like that, not on the platform. So, so certainly it's worth thinking about having a lawyer and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, types of lawyers on and off legal tech. How do I find a lawyer to help? Um, here's some generalizations. <laughs> on legal tech platforms, vetted by legal tech eh, platforms, excuse my misspelling there, to understand the forms and processes, processes instituted. So these lawyers that are on the legal tech platforms have been trained on these platforms. They understand the product, they understand the forms. So they're able to answer those questions very economically. Uh, they're usually lower cost initially, like for the first however many hours for the first project, but then you face their true fees. And so if you're in the thick of it with them initially, and it turns out you need another five to 10 hours worth of work because you've gotten started with them on something, you're probably gonna end up you know, going out of pocket or the company is for these legal services. Uh, and you would have, you, know, you end up paying the same anyway. In addition to that, a lot of the lawyers starting out, you know, I'm sure they're really smart people, but you know, they have to start out somewhere. So sometimes they align themselves with these platforms and they're, you know, they're less experienced. So they know how to do processes and templates and things like that, but they don't really address one-off situations all that well. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, and then you, in, you engage through the, with these lawyers through the platform. You find them and you're either assigned to one or you get to pick from three different lawyers. Again, when you're giving that, given that option, you should certainly look into the law firms, see how, how long the lawyer's been practicing law and, um, you know, do a meet and greet with them to make sure your personalities or, um, you know, uh, are compatible or that they understand your industry. If you're like, say in pharma or whatnot, you wanna make sure it's a compatible fit. Uh, off legal tech platforms, typically they do not promote legal tech platforms at all because, you know, legal tech platforms are in the past, in the past have been known for inaccuracies, lots of mistakes in documents. Um, you'd think with a template or form, they know where to put a period, a comma, and a lot of the times they try to do customization, they fail, um, and there's a lot of complexities, like I just mentioned, that these forms do not address. Let me give you the biggest example is if you're a company, if, if you're a founder who wants to incorporate in Delaware and you know that you're going to be issuing a convertible note in the future or going to be going through fundraising in the near future, automatically you should know to incorporate with preferred stock. Most founders don't know that. Most founders elect to have 10,000 shares of common stock, 10 million shares of common stock, and then they call it a day. And that's what a lot of the platforms allow for, the 10 million common stock. And there's nowhere anywhere about preferred stock that needs to be issued to investors or convertibles converting into preferred shares. Tanya, did you have a question? Came back on. No, I, there, there were a couple of there were a couple of questions on there, oh, but okay. uh, no, but it, it, exactly. Uh, we, we can go uh, the next time you have a, a, a natural break. We'll we'll, we'll okay. take the next okay. question. These um, so the lawyers are the, you know they provide custom non basic legal services. They're usually higher in cost and tend to be more experienced lawyers. Um, 
so they've seen a lot more. They've seen things, uh, you know, that are outside of the ordinary that come up maybe for venture back startups, well, more, more well-funded startups. Um, so, and that's okay. I mean, not everybody, every, not everybody wears a Tiffany diamond, but you know, they're making great sales. So, you know, there are Tiffany diamond purchasers out there. And so there's, you know, high cost legal service purchasers out there. Um, and so if that's for you, totally fine. Uh, legal tech platforms may not be for you from the get-go because you don't want to have to worry about wondering if you've done things, you know, if what, what you've created up front is sustainable for what you want to do in the future. Uh, these lawyers may be engaged off the platform through referral services, word of mouth. Um, I, you would find Rose Bullis Law right around here. <laughs> Um, simply because, you know, um, I am, I have been practicing a very long time, but my firm is two and a half years old. Um, and I choose not to be with a big law firm. I choose to grow my, you know, medium size or small size law firm. And you have a lot of us right in the middle, willing to work with founders on legal tech platforms and off. So it's just a matter of getting to know uh, the different lawyers in the space. I happen to be a securities lawyer, but there's uh, like, there are going to be IP lawyers or, um, other types of lawyers, uh, gosh, everything from tax to real estate to bankruptcy, God forbid, but, um, you know, all types of specialties. So not all lawyers are created the same. And um, so, so yeah, so these are, these are the two, the two types uh, that I wanted to talk about on this page, but I'm just curious as to the, what the questions might be, if they're related to this page, Tanya, and I can take them right now. So the question was more about, uh, about uh, trademarking and um, how to go about doing that. And can you use one of these legal tech platforms to do something like this? So, so I am not an IP lawyer, although I do light IP like licensing and, um, you know, agreements and such, you know, general IP related legal work. But if you're talking about actually putting in a trademark application or a patent, things like that, there are some companies that are trying to automate this. I don't know how good they are because I have not tried them myself, but I hear that they are growing. So there is an adaptation for, or the, there is a, um, a population of founders or new companies that are looking to these platforms for that. Um, I probably have a list somewhere and I'd be happy to provide that to whomever, but just know that they are out there. Uh, but most patent IP lawyers will tell you that that area of law is constantly changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. So you may be, you know, using the wrong form, you know, and, and also jurisdiction based. So California and Idaho may be two separate, you know, schools of thought on privacy or issues that relate to, to IP. So in the specialty areas, I would always have a lawyer ready to bounce off something, even if you can keep legal costs down. Even if you go through legal tech platforms, you can bounce a question off the lawyer without having to engage them for the whole process. So that's a way of keeping legal costs down. Um, I have lots of clients who use legal tech platforms who call me up or schedule a meeting and just go through all the, just the questions that they have related to the process. And They've just the best, they've saved best of both worlds. Yeah, best of both worlds. I, I I I didn't even think about that. But if you can, most lawyers I, won't. Yeah, most most veteran lawyers will not do that. They won't. They'll be like, I will not even get involved with that because right because it makes so they much. Think they're gonna. They think they're gonna backstop the process. I always make it clear that you ask me questions, I'm gonna answer generally as it relates to what I know. I don't know if it's compatible with how the the platform operates. You need to compare. But this is what I understand to be the case. And usually it's usually we're on the same level. I'm on the same level with the platform. I have other sources besides the platform. Obviously. Lawyers have a variety of resources, including the law to look at and case law to, to determine whether, you know, current law stands on a particular. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but. That was helpful, that was helpful. And, and then as a reminder too, to everybody, uh, we can always uh, uh, ask questions to some of the, the mentors too, because I know a lot of attorneys don't feel the same way that you do. And, and so um, that's why I'm so grateful that you're, um, that you're doing this with us, so yeah. 
how to choose the right self-service legal tech. What can I do to make sure I pick right? Okay, so I made a, I, I made a list of steps to maybe help you along with your research. Uh, step one, make a list of the legal services you need. A lot of the times, uh, just like when you're building your business and you're going out to customers and asking them like, what do you wanna see with my product? Same thing with uh, trying to figure out what legal services you really need. Um, sometimes if you go to a human lawyer, they'll try to oversell you things that you don't need. So it's really good that you kind of investigate the area that you're trying to get legal services for to make sure if you really need something or not. Um, it's kind of like taking your car into the shop, right? You go in for your brakes, but you come out with new tires. It's, it's always the same. You kind of need to be involved with the process, do some research, do due diligence, and then you'll be better informed to make decisions on whether you need to move forward with something recommended or not. Uh, so, and then step two is make a list of legal tech platforms you have researched and the needs they satisfy. Not all platforms are the same. Some only take you to a certain extent, others don't take you. Um, you know, they take you only to, or, or they do go all the way, but then they're all the way is, you know, maybe um, more commonly adopted in the East Coast versus the West Coast. Biggest example is, well, what I've seen is stock options being offered to advisors, mostly on the East Coast versus on the West Coast, it tends to be restricted stock agreements, right? Restricted stock. So um, I've, you know, noticed that in certain platforms who are like guiding you through their processes. So make a list of the platforms that you've researched and what you need. Uh, interview founders who have used the legal tech platforms you're interested in. This is so important. Um, don't just go and say, well, this looks good. You need to go find somebody who's actually used it or contact the platform and say, do you have people I can talk to that have used your platform? I'd really love to get some insight. Um, I have founders who are on Gust Launch. Gust Launch is a very good platform. It's, it's based in New York and they do a lot of Delaware incorporations um, and they're, they're starting to be widely adopted just like LegalZoom or some of these other platforms. And, um, you know, they offer founders who are interested in using their platform to speak to other founders on their platform. They literally connect you with other founders, which I think is fantastic because now you're not in the dark. You're actually speaking to people using their platform. And a lot of the issues are the same. So uh, fourth step, interview lawyers off the legal tech platform for estimates on the same needs. Um, you know, I know a handful of firms that charge, you know, anything from, you know, $3,500 to $7,500 for incorporation. Why, right? Why? Well, my forms are worth this because it, they tackle this issue, this issue, this issue. But okay, but those issues come down the road, uh, not going to be facing these issues in two to three years, and I can replace my bylaws, right? So, Maybe it's something I don't need right now. Um, so definitely, and then there, I'm sorry, but there are founders who are like, I don't care. I'm going to buy the Gucci purse because I like wearing a Gucci purse. And, you know, they are, it's a well-known brand firm and it's going to help me in other ways. Fine. Go pay the 7500 for a corporation. Uh, whereas you can get, you know, incorporation somewhere else for 300 to each his own. But in any event, go get estimates, go understand what the value of the legal services are, see what's best for you, see how it's going to work for you long term, understand what your needs are. If you're going to bootstrap your company and you have a product and it's not going to take very long for you to sell your company on your own with a team of five, why on earth would you go hire a lawyer or a law firm that's going to charge all this money for fundraising advice when you don't plan to do that, you know, things like that. Um, fifth step, begin using legal tech platform for the needs, often basic, but be ready to pull in a lawyer. So again, start basic, it's fine, but you know, have already interviewed lawyers to understand who's going to be ready to help you with what. Don't just wait to the last minute and then just say, I'm going to go with so-and-so because I need something done tomorrow. Well, so-and-so may not be the best choice for you. I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has any questions on this slide. So I didn't see any questions, but I did just want to give you a warning. We're 10 minutes to the hour. Okay, going quickly. 
Okay, so here's some additional reading for you. I won't go too much into detail here, but um, the, so this is just an article that I saw that was really helpful in kind of outlining all of the best startup uh, legal tech platforms out there. And then um, reinventing the practice of law. This is actually an art article from the American Bar Association to give some legitimacy on these online legal services and look what to look out for when using them. Okay, self-service legal tech questionnaire. Um, here is the link. Um, I have this actually, Tanya, on a different, I don't think I can hit this. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then share the document. I was just going to ask, I did have a question where people had asked if uh, you would be willing to share the slides. And I know I have a copy of your slides as well, if yeah. you are. Yeah, so let me set up. Perfect, if you can do that, then um, I can I can actually put the, uh, link to the slides into the um, yeah. into the yeah the the description of the of the YouTube video. So cool, great. Yeah, not no problem. So there are various questionnaires out there. So I I decided to create one, and a lot of the questions are the same. You're going to see a lot of these in digital form. So you're not going to see it like this. You're going to see it as they pop up, and you're going to answer the questions as you go. And then the system is gonna populate whatever documents you use. But I want you to see some of the questions or things to look out for uh, so that you're prepared to answer the questionnaire so that the pop, you know, the forms that you need are populated correctly. Um, you know, write down starting from the type of entity that you need. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with all of these entity forms. Um, and then, you know, Knowing what an S corporation is as it relates to a C corp or an LLC, that's I have a video out on that very topic, don't I, Tanya? So, but yep. here, and, and I'm only going to go over this briefly because I know we're running out of time, but you have access to this form. Um, and, you know, where do you want to, where do you want to form the entity? So just because you're in California or somewhere else, I mean, you could certainly form it in Delaware, but there are actually uh, founders who are forming in Idaho or they're forming in Nevada because they find that having a formation there as it relates to their industry is more favorable. Mm -hmm. um, I won't get into that today, but do some reading up on that. You'll, you'll be very surprised to see that even like uh, real estate structures or fund structures or different types of animals of, of, of entities can be more better served if they're in a different jurisdiction behind uh besides Delaware and I know it's you're probably surprised to hear this uh let's see so this is just having to do with California and Delaware but um so the primary purpose is it are you starting a business are you acquiring a business are you changing a business entity are you there's different reasons to form an entity some people form entities to hold real estate some people form entities to hold a variety of assets uh, so that actually has a lot to do with what your bylaws are going to say. So uh, just keep that in mind that the questionnaires, the questions you may get, go to that. Uh, what is the proposed entity name? What is the alternative name? Uh, Delaware uh, has a really swift system now on telling you whether you have a name availability or not quite quickly. But for old fashioned folks who want to mail in a few names and see what you get in a few weeks, it's certainly still a possibility. Um, let's see, will you operate the business under the name or will you be doing a DBA or a subsidiary? Uh, believe it or not, some folks uh, form Delaware corporations as a holding company, but then they want to form different lines of businesses through different uh, structures under the holding company. So you can actually have a holding company corporation and then an LLC or a series of LLCs that can be held under that corporation. Different reasons for doing that. Uh, mostly the ones I know is because they want to hold investments in those LLCs. Uh, let's see, will you operate connect business under the name? Oh, we would did that one. Um, contact information for the new business. Have that ready to give when you're forming your company. Biggest mistake I see is founders putting their personal address and all of a sudden uh, that's appearing somewhere on the Delaware website or somewhere else because a lot of, <laughs> a lot of companies that deal with startups 
pull information from these public websites and all of a sudden you're getting solicited or you're on avo or <laughs> that's for lawyers but you know you find yourself on the in your your personal addresses on these websites <laughs> okay um let's see i know i'm running out of time but i'm trying to let's see um okay ownership so how many founders are there going to be how much ownership are you going to each have Right. So, and then, you know, how much money is going to be infused? Are you starting with 0. 0.0001 cent or are you starting with 0. 0.001? Why? And you should know the industry in which you're starting your company and what's typical for your initial par value of your stock. Okay. So, anyway, I know we're running out of time, but here's some of the other questions um, that you can look at on your own. They're pretty, you know, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, but there are things here that are, um, you know, may prompt some questions that I'd be happy to go over with, with you on my office hours. Um, or, you know, Tanya, I'm sure you've covered a lot of these questions in your classes or, you know, some of your, you know. Um, but yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that there and get back to the, the presentation and then uh, leave for questions at the end. So let okay. me get okay. back to the presentation. And I will, I will grab that link for all of you so that we can, uh, for, for those of us here um, in the workshop can, can have access to that. And if any of you need to leave for another class, uh, we understand it's fine, but- um, Sorry about that. Uh, no, 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 we'll stick around um, afterwards. We, we don't have any um, classes ourselves scheduled right, right now. So um, yeah, feel free. Great. Okay. So, okay, I mean, that was- <laughs> That was basically it. Um, so here's how to get in touch with me uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like some more insight as to some of the companies that I was uh, indirectly referencing today. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about where you can find them. I did give you three links. And then um, I'm at Q&A, Tanya. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we, we made it in just under the, just under the wire. So um, I will, uh, what I'll do now is I will just remind everybody, please do uh, fill out the, the survey that John has put in the chat so that we can get some feedback to give uh, to Rose and we can decide what to do on the next workshop. I've already already got a message from somebody asking for, for more of this. So um, we, we can definitely uh, accommodate if we know what you're looking for. And um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and then take a one-on-one Q&A -on -one from here. Oh, Rose, do you want to leave, leave us with anything? Is there anything you want to end with? Uh, I was just going to say that um, this quote I thought was very appropriate. Computers are going to take over certain legal tasks. The practice of law will focus more on advice. Absolutely true. And um, one thing that I wanted to, I wouldn't say it's an announcement, but I'm very much into legal tech such that I believe that AI is going to function as some sort of um, stand-in for lawyers that aren't getting back to their clients as fast as they should be. Mm -hmm. So um, one of these days, um, don't be surprised if you see me in the form of AI for just basic questions at a very lower cost so that there could be more accessibility to my, to my brain. <laughs> So we'll leave it there and I'll, I'll stop share. Is that okay, Tanya? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. And thank you everyone for, for being here. And if you have any questions, just stick around after the workshop. We'll see you again at the next.